Good afternoon. I'm Joe Matthews, uh, editor and uh, California columnist at uh, Zocalo Public Square, media nonprofit here in Los Angeles. Um, welcome. This is a pretty incredible panel. I'm told not to go into full intros because you should have them, and and, and there they are. Um, and um, you know, we're um, we're talking about a, a a big transition in the life of our state uh, and our country. Um, you know, I'm also I'm a big fan of country music. And um, one of the sort of rising stars in country music is based here in LA is a young woman named Jamie Wyatt. Um, and one of her more, she's got, she's got a lot of California songs, one about Wasco up in Northern Kern County and one about the county jail. Um, but she's got also a, a, a song uh, about cannabis in the business. Uh, uh, she rides on the Redwood Highway for a bit and then she, she sings, hey, marijuana man, you got a lot to lose now. And so the stakes are high. Um, the <laughs> Good job. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. If I yeah. went any longer, uh, uh, <laughs> Milken would have to pay me scale. So, um, so you know, there's stakes to this. Um, there's stakes for this industry. There's stakes for our state, our country, um, you know, for banking, um, for the environment, uh, for entertainment, retail, children, education, and the like. Um, and we're going to try to get to the bottom of it. Um, California is already the nation's largest producer um, of medical marijuana. It's a $7 billion industry, and it's poised to become the largest recreational marijuana market in the world. Um, so um, to uh, sort of start this off as we go into this transition, um, which is starting to happen and officially takes place in, in January, uh, just after Christmas, as the Rose Bowl is being played. Um, um, what, I, I'd asked each of you this question, what um, does success look like in this transition? And, and, and what, you know, for people who are in this and in a lot of different realms, you know, what, um, you know, what are you going to be looking at to sort of judge how well this is going? I want to start on my right um, with Adam Bierman, who's the CEO and co-founder of Medman, uh, a leading cannabis management investment firm based right here in Los Angeles. Um, what's success in this? Well, I mean, I think California is in, California is very unique when it comes to the world of pot, um, you know, and we, we kind of, we've seen it all over North America as we play in and out of all these markets. And I think, you know, California is unique because of its size. It's unique because of its cultural influence. It's unique because of its political influence, um, not just in the United States, but in the world, right? Like that's a, it's just a whole new ball game. We're talking about California, which like, exports its culture and exports its policy and exports what happens here across the world. And so I think it's a double edged, right? I think that the bar is very high for California. You know, California was the first state to legalize medical marijuana in 1996. Um, so California, uh, as a community, has had the longest time to be around this in some form or fashion. Um, and California also has the benefit now to look at the 29 states that have legalized marijuana in some form or fashion that have rolled programs out um, and set precedents and learn and get better. So I think, look, sheer size, California is enormous. But I think that <clears throat> California is on a pedestal, as it should be. And I think it needs, success for me is learning from the mistakes um, of all of the other states that have preceded California. Just to be clear, California legalized medical marijuana in 1996 has never had a licensing program. So California is a, what we call a gray market. Um, there is no other state in the union that looks like California. You're either a licensed operator in a legitimate program or you're an illegal operator and you're going to jail, right? California is the only place where you've had this middle ground. Um, and so now California gets to benefit from Nevada, you know, Ohio, Arizona, Washington, Colorado, all these other states that have done it. And I think California needs to do it best. And I guess to round it out, doing it best means creating a program that you know, licenses uh, good actors, that um, figures out how to eliminate the bad actors and the illegal operators, um, and foster an environment where the public can participate in a lawful manner with the new marijuana program in a way that feels above board. Um, Matt, uh, Matt de Bonnet, I'm saying that right? I was an assembly member of the 45th District, Western San Fernando Valley. Um, what, what's your answer to the question? What does success look like? You've kind of spent a lot of time in the legislature. 
you know, trying to figure this out, bring medical and recreational yeah. together. What, what, what's, what are you looking for? I'll start by saying I am the least knowledgeable on <laughs> marijuana of anyone on this panel. I'm here for my specific knowledge of marijuana banking as chair of the California State Assembly Banking and Finance Committee. Uh, I would kind of pick up with what Adam said. I think success for California would not to be stuck in these middle areas, would not to be stuck in these gray areas, to have clarity, uh, to have some type of very specific set of regulations that even the playing field, uh, so people know how to operate, so consumers know uh, from quality and pricing uh, to how much of it is going to the tax uh, base that they want to see provide more parks and schools and all the benefits that we were sold when we were talking about legalizing it. And in my niche, I'd like to see uh, something in terms of success, which I think is going to be the hardest component of this, uh, allowing these now legal businesses to be treated in all aspects as a legal business. And right now we cannot do that because of our banking laws, because of our federal banking laws. Uh, we've seen Colorado and Washington struggle with this. Uh, we are struggling with this. The Obama administration tried to kind of run the middle course. Uh, they had the Cole memo and uh, for, for those who don't know, what, what's specifically the, the, the problem? Is it, it's that right the banks are afraid of what the feds well, might Well, there are lots do? of problems, but the main thing is that marijuana is still classified as a Schedule One drug with heroin, cocaine, I mean, we go on and on. And unfortunately, our federal laws prohibit financial institutions from doing any uh, interactions or transactions with businesses engaged with Schedule One drugs. And we saw the Obama administration not want to make the, I was really somewhat hopeful that towards the end of his administration he would declassify it. I think some people thought I was a little crazy or too optimistic. Clearly that did not happen. <laughs> what they did do is try to get this middle ground where we had things like the Cole Memo and we had things with uh, FINSA where we're trying to ease banks into this idea of doing business with marijuana businesses. We were trying to give them some kind of loopholes almost and create this kind of like we said, unspoken middle ground or gray area where they could operate. We've seen even in California where banks and credit unions do through third party kind of channels do bank marijuana businesses. Uh, and we had an attorney general for eight years that wasn't gonna come in and break that up or, or give them any problems. Under this new administration and specifically a new attorney general, it's gonna be very hard for us to be in any gray area. It's gonna be very hard for us to be in any middle ground without clarity. And until we solve this banking idea, and, I, and I'm sorry with all due respect to our treasurer, uh, a fleet of armored trucks just to pick up the cash and take it to a depository is not the answer. That, that is a band-aid on a bullet hole. So for me, success is creating through technology, until we get a change at the federal level, creating through technology some type of setup where legal businesses have access to our financial institutions, and I don't have a great answer right now for that. And just for clarity, for those who are not following as closely as the State Treasurer, John Chung's working group came out with a number of, of, of suggestions, including proposing or calling for a state bank, and also you yeah. would get uh, sort of the armored card, perhaps, yeah. to take you to yeah. when you turn and in your just, taxes. Just because that's important, but on the state bank, <coughs> Colorado looked at creating a state bank. The problem is, if that state bank is not connected to any other bank or financial mm -hmm. institution, it really is just kind of a sitting duck. I mean, it basically is a building that's gonna store the cash, and if you can get the cash safely and store it somewhere safely, that's great, that's part of the problem. But if it has no connectivity, if people can't use their credit card at these legal businesses, if they can't use other financial tools that we're accustomed to using in a very interconnected and getting more interconnected financial system, then that is not really, to me, a solution and especially as we move forward. But I, I, our office is looking at things like Bitcoin and virtual currency, and, and there's a lot of other technologically forward-thinking people doing this work, too. So we'll, that's we'll, we'll get, We're going to get more into this. I want to uh, bring in uh, Kat Packer, who is the, the first executive director of the City of Los Angeles Department of Cannabis Regulation. Congratulations on that. Um, now, say we're trying to get beyond gray areas, but, you know, the, the, the way that the, this transition is working in California, a lot of power uh, and choice is left to local governments, uh, such as the one you work for. And um, you know, as I travel the state, it's very different uh, depending where I am. And no one is, you know, they haven't yet posted the different, you know, marijuana laws there next to the, you know, the, when the meeting of the Elks are going to be when I wander into the city. <laughs> so, so, um, so. You know what? When you when for local you know, government, a city that some people think should be going a little faster, right into this, <laughs> um, what's success look like for you? 
Uh, it's, it's interesting to talk about success in the context of how we move forward with cannabis policy. I, I think that what we can say with absolute certainty is that the drug war has not been successful. Uh, I think that we can say with certainty that marijuana prohibition has not been successful. Uh, and any step we take towards making progress towards uh, treating cannabis uh, and the folks who use cannabis in a uh, public health context rather than a criminal justice context, then that is progress in itself alone. Uh, I think that Los Angeles, as the largest city to regulate uh, commercial cannabis activity and, and the largest, uh, the second largest city in the country, uh, we are forced to lead uh, a lot of these conversations. And in order for us to be successful, uh, I've, I've created an acronym. Uh, acronyms are very helpful to me. I'm a visual learner. I need uh, learning tools. Uh, but but what, I've, what I've been working with is that we know that cannabis is here. Uh, so what do we do with cannabis now that we know that it is here? H-E-R-E. -E. Uh, the four things that we need to do in order to move forward is to treat this as a health issue. Uh, that's the H. Uh, we need to make sure that we are educated. Uh, that is the first E. We need to make sure that we are regulating responsibly. That's the R. Uh, and we need to make sure that there are enforcement mechanisms uh, in place. But I think that if we can strike a balance between health, education, regulation, and enforcement, and if we can do all four of those things equitably, uh, that's how we move forward with success in this context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to your left, uh, Hezekiah Allen, who is the executive director of the California Growers Association. How many members are there of the California Grocers Asso uh, Growers Association? <laughs> Not the Grocers. The Grocers, I have no idea. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we currently, we just broke 1,300 members, so we are the largest association of cannabis growers and businesses in the state. Um, success from our perspective is pretty simple. Uh, we, we've got a basic metric. Um, but I'm going to sort of give some backstory before actually giving you the metric naturally. So unregulated agriculture is bound to have impacts. A cash-heavy industry is bound to have impacts. The gray market that we've been forced to exist in for the last two decades, and you know, frankly, we were already a leader, a global leader in cannabis when Proposition 215 passed. So this is nothing new here in California. Um, there's a lot of folks operating in it, and most importantly, there, there really is a public safety and environmental crisis. Where I come from, you know, I, I have a background in watershed restoration, tremendous impacts to our fisheries, to our water resources. Um, and you come from Humboldt County? I come County. from Humboldt County, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sir, <laughs> we've seen it firsthand. We've, we've seen home invasions. We've seen violent crimes. There, there really is a crisis in, in this gray area. And so we need to move past that, that crisis. And, and in our, from our perspective, there's really only one way to achieve that, and that's to create enough opportunity for an existing, robust, multi-billion dollar agricultural marketplace that exists today. If you want to consume cannabis in California today, there's a really good chance you have access to it. And, and you know, we're growing it. As, as Joe mentioned there, we're, we're, as with so many other agricultural commodities, we are supplying the nation with this product. That has to stop. And so we have a very tricky challenge here where market forces are simply not going to work because there are artificial constraints on the demand side of this marketplace. And so from our perspective, in the interim, full federal regulation is coming. Public opinion is there. The policymakers will catch up. Hopefully conversations like this one will help expedite that. But in the meantime, we need more businesses, not fewer larger businesses, more smaller businesses. That will give those businesses the ability to transition out of the shadows into the light. That will allow them to comply with regulations that will help solve that environmental crisis, address the public safety issues. And then the icing on the cake for all of this is that we need a robust, diverse marketplace that looks like California. We can't have an industry that looks like some of the industries of the past. This is such a unique opportunity to build a 21st century industry on the principles of equity, inclusion, diversity, um, sustainability. Let's, let's do this. And then the last, the, the sprinkle on top of the sundae, if you will, we've got a cake and some icing. The cherry on top is that we maintain diversity, not in business owners, but of varietals. How many people here know that there are probably two to three times many as varietals of cannabis as there are wine grapes? The value of the global wine marketplace is in its diversity, the robust expressions of the substance itself. Cannabis is the same way too. So let's keep diversity, let's keep small businesses, and let's make sure everyone out there operating has a fair chance to get into regulation, and then let's move forward. Um, I'm gonna move to Curran Woodhera, who's the managing partner at, at Casa Verde Capital, which is the leading venture uh, capital firm in the, in this industry. 
So you're, you're investing here. What, what is success for you, um, you know, as an investor and as part of an investment community around this, this yeah. transition? So I think, you know, similar to what uh, a lot of the panels have said, as far as, you know, an inclusive environment, one with really clear regulations so businesses know what they're doing, they're not afraid of, uh, you know, potentially, um, you know, the, the lines being very clear so you know which side uh, of the fence you're standing on. I think right now, again, in this gray area, a lot of businesses, whether they are growers, dispensaries, or, you know, on the ancillary side of the world, which is what we focus on, um, are often confused as to, you know, what is legal in their state, in their municipality, et cetera. So I think a lot of clear uh, legislation there is very helpful. And I think once we have that, um, you know, that will be very successful. And then one other thing that I don't think, um, you know, is equally important is, uh, you know, having regulations in place to make sure that we have really clean product as well, um, you know, in the state. So I think for California in particular, we've had a lot of problems, um, you know, where uh, there's been pesticides used and, you know, um, the, the lab testing uh, has pointed out that there, you know, there's not necessarily the, the most robust clean product that we should have in a, in a large industry. <coughs> and I think, um, you know, that's one other element that I would add as far as what success looks like as an environment also where we have, you know, clean product for, for consumers as well. Um, in to, again, to everyone, it, it, a lot of the, the story so far have said this, is, this could be a fairly messy transition <laughs> in 2018. Um, and I guess, um, I mean, you've all touched on things. The, the, you know, I was in Santa Rosa before the fires, and um, people, companies were there looking to desperately hire lab technicians to do work in this. Um, just building this sort of infrastructure, the, the regulations are still late. That's not, you know, um, well, it's not anyone's fault except, you know. We, okay, so, you know, there's this, the whole infrastructure of an industry still has to come into place. And I guess, you know, since ultimately on a social level, we're trying to, this is the goal, the goal here is to do what Kat talked about, which is to take us out of this drug war and, and take people out of the black market, um, um, you know, in, and, out of, and the whole state out of this gray market, as you mentioned, Adam. So my, my question is, you know, if any of you have a real sense of where the tipping point is, to where we, ha you know, where do we have to get to the where the black market is going to shrink, you know, to to something that's negligible. I mean, how do we, how much do we, what do we need in terms of investment or regulation um, to get us to the point where this is a this is an industry that has enough infrastructure to really be able to stand on its own? How long that's going to take? I, you go ahead. I don't want to be the pessimist on the panel, but it's going to take federal policy reform. Uh, California is currently producing about 16 million pounds of cannabis. We're capable of consuming probably 4 million of that. 2.5 is currently consumed in the state with only 600,000 consumed in the regulated market. Those are not good numbers. The likelihood of us scaling back an agricultural commodity by 70%, I mean, I, I don't know what world we would have we'd to live in where that'd be plausible. Probably, right? It's going to be a long time. I think what we can do, though, is move the entirety of California's marketplace into the regulated state. Our estimate right now is that there's about 12,500 12, retailers operating in the state. We estimate less than 250 of those will be ready for licensure on Gen 1. We estimate 55,000 independent grows. We estimate about 3,000 of those will be ready for licensure on Gen 1. Those aren't good numbers either. That's not enough to meet the entirety of the in-state marketplace. Uh, and, and what we really need to focus on, as, as Ms. Ajax, who uh, Kat's uh, counterpart at the, the Bureau in Sacramento, Lori Ajax says, we need to focus on what's on our, our control and our in-state marketplace really is the focus to me. I think if we get to 8,000 growers and 4,000 retailers, we'd be in a pretty good shot and be in striking distance of making that transition, just to put numbers on it. The same question taking deeper into the acronym which you laid out, which was really good. Like, what, you know, what, what needs to, what do we, where do we need to get to get there? Uh, I, I think it's going to take a lot for us to get there. Uh, and I think that Los Angeles is kind of un uniquely situated uh, in, in its challenge to get there. Uh, the city of Los Angeles has a, uh, a, a large number of illicit operators, uh, people who have been operating longer than I've been alive. Uh, and, and they uh, like to tell me so also. Me too. Uh, <laughs> me too. So that's, that's always fun. Um, but, but, but what that unique challenge comes with, we are, we're essentially disrupting an economy. 
that already exists in the, in the state of California and in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and sometimes disruptions are necessary. Uh, we, we've come to a point where California voters and Los Angeles voters have said, we don't want to do what we're doing anymore. Uh, we understand that cannabis is on the streets. Uh, kids have access to cannabis. The, the products that are on the streets aren't being tested. We're not getting any of this tax revenue back. Uh, so how do we move forward? And that's going to take disrupting an economy. Uh, people aren't going to be excited about this. Uh, I, before I moved over uh, and, and started to work for the city of Los Angeles, I, I worked for the Drug Policy Alliance. And while I was there, uh, I, I served as a campaign coordinator uh, in support of Proposition 64. Uh, and it was interesting because a lot of the medical industry was very much against legalization. Uh, there, there were groups of organized cannabis uh, industry participants who said, we do not want full legalization. We're fine with the way that things are right now. Why would we change anything? Uh, and I was frustrated by, by, by some of those sentiments because I could tell that those are the folks who, who weren't experiencing uh, the disproportionate enforcement uh, that was taking place. <clears throat> those are folks who were being able to uh, benefit from gray market areas. Uh, and, and people benefit from, from confusion. There were a ton of lawyers who made money uh, in the midst of, of all of this confusion. Uh, but there were lots of cannabis <coughs> folks who did not want this. Uh, and so there is this industry resistance to, to regulation. Uh, I've heard it described as, you know, California's cannabis manifest destiny. Uh, you know, folks should be able to grow as many plants as they want. And there are people in this space who feel as though uh, you shouldn't be able to tell them what they do with their plants. Uh, and we have decided as a, as a state, uh, as a city, that we are getting ready to tell you about 510 things to do with those yeah. plants. Uh, and, and, and people aren't happy about that. And so I, I think that part of the conversation that has to happen uh, within law and public policy is making sure that these requests are reasonable. Uh, of course, there are costs with compliance. Uh, there are going to be huge costs with compliance. But I think that we have to understand that there are also huge costs with non-compliance. Uh, there are huge costs when people can get their hands on product that hasn't been tested. Uh, there are huge costs uh, when, when we are not getting tax revenue back into our, our city and state coffers. And so we have to strike a balance between uh, folks who don't want anything to do with cannabis uh, and the folks who don't want you to do anything with their cannabis. And that's not easy. I want to ask the same question. Thank you very much. I want to ask the same question of Adam, um, but with a particular spin. I mean, you're, what, do, is there enough investment in, in this industry to build it out, to build the infrastructure that's needed for it to be healthy? Are you, are you undercapitalized? And if so, how much? Well, I don't know how much time I'm allowed to have for this answer. So I'll just take up all my time for this answer, and then I won't talk again if you don't want me to. No, um, no, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> so look, amen to Kat, right? Like, and Kat can't even go as far as me because she's like government official or something really fancy now, and I can say whatever I want. So here's what I'll say. Like, <clears throat> you, want, you want to make this as the least messy as possible, this transition, take the gloves off, right? Like, you know, the numbers that were mentioned, um, all those people, I agree, should have an opportunity to go behave and be good, upstanding citizens and be regular business people. If they want to grow pot and sell it, you know, and ship it across the country and keep their cash and not pay taxes, then they should be treated like me running an illegal casino in Los Angeles, right? So. I think the harsh way to look at this, if we're just going to cut through everything, is you want to make this as seamless as you can, which it won't be seamless, it's going to be messy, is look, if you want to be in the marijuana business, it's got to be a real business. right? This thought that people are resisting, to Kat's point, like amen to her points, right? People are resisting because they've been doing this, what, they've been operating as criminals for so long and they deserve the right to continue their criminality, right? Like, that's absurd to me. Right, so you want to go operate as a criminal, you go to jail. If I want to go open a brothel or I want to open a casino, like you think I can open a casino in downtown Los Angeles and just be willy-nilly and then have my cash and no, right? I'm gonna come get shut down and I'm gonna go to jail. So look, if you wanna you wanna make this transition right, I don't disagree with the comment about federal legalization, but you know California is in a position, again. This is the world stage. This is California. This is its own country. Just go do it right. Take the gloves off. You ask a question about investing. There are two things that need to happen, in my opinion, for this to work. One, 
is you've got to take the gloves off, the kid gloves off, that I think so often in California specifically, this is a California specific issue, kid gloves dealing with legacy operators. The reason this doesn't exist anywhere else is because there aren't legacy operators anywhere else applying for licenses. It's starting from scratch. So in Ohio, we legalize medical marijuana in Ohio, and you apply for the first time. You're not saying, hey, man, I've been growing it for 20 years in my basement, and now I'm going to get a license. You're saying, hey, I'm a well-to-do business person, or I put a group together, and I'm applying for a license. So it's clean. California has this baggage of 20 years of gray, and you're trying to transition it. You're not going to transition it with kid gloves. So transition it and say, hey, whatever the numbers were, there's 5,000 people growing, selling, whatever it is. Here's the application. Go ahead and behave. Fill out the application, be a regulated, look, and this isn't even like a regulated grocery store. This is a, this is a drug. It's a mind-altering substance. We should be hyper-regulated. Bring it on. Like, if you want to legitimize this industry, then bring it on. Hyper-regulate me. I'm a casino. I'm a brothel. I'm a pharmaceutical company. I don't care what you want to analogize this to. This, is, this needs to be a highly regulated industry. Regulate the actors. Give them licenses. So the two things that need to happen, Again, I'm getting all going. This That's, is my this life. This is good. This is good. <laughs> all right? So the two things that need to happen, in my humble opinion, one is you got to make it legitimate. The way you make it legitimate, you asked about <coughs> investment, yeah. right? You have to treat this like I look at casinos all the time. So this is like the casino industry. How do casinos work? Now look, to the point, there's room. California's going to issue 15,000 plus licenses or whatever the target is. I want everybody to be able to participate, mom and pop to big corporate. But the only way to do that is to create a system that allows for it. Right now, the way that the regs are written in California and Los Angeles, and they will evolve, this is an evolution, is private equity, it's a pain in the ass. Like, it's a pain in the ass for us to invest in this industry because of the disclosures, because of all the things that are there, which I, I say that are well-intended, well-intended, poorly executed. So one is you have to welcome real business to act like real business, and two is enforce. Like, why are we being nice to criminals? You know, if, if we're giving criminals a chance to have amnesty, like, this is insane to me. You have people that are admitting, Kat just said they've been telling her that they've been doing this longer than she'd be alive. So they're like, hey, you know, mayor's office woman, here's the deal. I've been a criminal all these years. Here's my amnesty card, but I'm going to complain. You know what? I want to make, I shouldn't be taxed that much. I, like, are you crazy? You walk in and say, I've been a criminal for 10 years, you go to jail. So we're already giving criminals amnesty, create a real program, let real business participate, and then enforce. And if there are 1,200 shops or 1,500 shops in Los Angeles and only two of them get 200 get licensed on day one, you know, if I show up on day two and the rest are still open, I'm going to be jumping up and down like a crazy person. I'm going to use my brothel analogy or my casino analogy, and I'm going to go to the press and say, hey, I'm going to go open up a casino, I think, in West Hollywood, and we'll see how it goes. Okay. Um, you're on a roll. I want to get back to Matt and talk about <laughs> banking. But, um, no, please. I, I, I defer. But, but, I but, defer. I, but, I, but since we were starting to talk about investment, I, I, I did want to ask you, you know, um, really, can you tell us a little more about it? I mean, wh what's the case for investing in this, given all the uncertainty and risks? I mean, and who are the biggest investors in this industry? Are we, we going to have a, a cannabis billionaire in this state? Is it going to be you? I mean, um, I what, what, is the, what is the what is the what is the what is the investment picture and, and the investment case in this? <clears throat> so, from investment since day one, I've always looked at this like casinos. For those that are in the investment world, uh, you know, 19 mid 1960s, uh, early 1970s. For those that weren't paying attention or weren't alive back then, you know, no money was going into gaming. Wall Street wouldn't touch it. It was criminal. It was this. It was this industry. You had criminal element that were running above board licensed or quasi licensed businesses mm -hmm. that were skimming, that were dealing with cash, that were not paying taxes, that were not hyper regulated, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happened? For those that pay attention to the gaming stuff, then what happened was, you know, Steve Wynn went to Las Vegas and started playing around and said, well, this is crazy. I can go raise money. And Michael Milken said, oh, I'll help you raise money. And he said, well, wait, Wall Street won't touch this. Public markets won't touch this. I can't get real investor dollars into this thing. This is all gangster money. And Michael Milken said, I'll raise you a bunch of money. You know what they did? He went ahead, he made a deal. He bought the Golden Nugget. Then they went to New Jersey. They raised over $100 million, did that. Then they came back to Vegas. And now Vegas was Wall Street. So what's the investment case for this industry? When they did that, gaming wasn't as evolved in this country as marijuana is. Marijuana, the demand is there. This is a, this is a mature market. 
that's completely illegitimate. And we're going through a transition to make it legitimate. The case for investing is, would you have liked to give Michael Milken or Steve Wynn in 1972 $100,000? I think you'd be pretty good right now. So, you know, there are going to be that. There are the first wave of investors or investment coming into this space in a legitimate fashion. And oftentimes, we get it all the time from investors. Well, my friend bought a warehouse in Denver, and he made 1,000% on his money. It's like, OK, well then, in my opinion, five years ago, your friend invested with some gangsters in Las Vegas and got some cash. Now we're talking about investing in the institutional evolution of this industry. So you want to be at the forefront of this industry as it becomes institutionalized and get those kind of outsized returns. Now's the time to invest in cannabis. So I get riled up like this because I'm never going to see this again, and nobody in this room will ever see this again. Um, Kern, you're also in the investment piece of this. Yep. Um, and, and in a very broad, looking at it in a broad way, what's your answer to the question? What is the investment picture? What's the case? And, and who's big in this? You know, who's the... Who's the Steve Wynn? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is absolutely a sort of once in a lifetime opportunity. You've never seen an industry like this with its growth patterns. You know, some are estimating from sort of growing 30, 35% a year. The closest comps to that are, you know, cable in the 90s and, you know, broadband. So it's a really exciting time um, for, for investment. And I think because of the uncertainty at the federal level and you know, even the issues we're dealing with at the state level, it's kept a lot of people on the sidelines. But that's why Adam has the opportunity he has. That's why we have the opportunity we have, right? We're ready to step up and you know, take a risk there uh, and get involved ahead of uh, full-scale federal legalization. And I think that is the sort of opportunity which creates, obviously, an element of risk, but at the same time gives us, again, this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity you know, Adam mentioned it from the casino end, and you can mention it, you know, to a number of other industries which were there. I think the most common analogy we hear about is around prohibition in the 20s, right? And, you know, do you want to be the liquor barons of that day who were growing? At the end of the day, I don't think that's exactly how it's going to happen with cannabis. That's not how we've seen it even happen in the regulated states like Colorado, uh, Nevada, and Washington, Oregon, et cetera. Um, but, you know, there are other opportunities. We tend to focus on the ancillary end, which has the, um, basically, sorry for those who don't know, ancillary companies in cannabis industries, anyone who doesn't touch the plant. So technology, software, packaging, media, et cetera. Um, you know, we think they have the ability to touch the entire industry in, in all its formats, whether it's you know, medical focus, whether it's adult use focus, whether you know, it's on the <coughs> pharmaceutical end, et cetera. Um, and that's why we, we focus there on, on our end. I, pro I promise I'm never talking. Can you no, no, keep talking. Yeah, please, yeah. Please. I'm sorry, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you use the word risk. Yeah. Like, why invest in this industry? So the chairman of our, of our fund is a guy named Chris Levy, former CIO of BlackRock. His last job, he managed a quarter trillion dollars. His current job, he messes around with us with a couple hundred million, OK? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> he says that he has never seen a more inefficient marketplace in his entire life. This is somebody that was on the Global Investment Committee for BlackRock, making decisions around the world with a quarter trillion dollars. He's never seen a more inefficient market in his life. Now, the reason is, you say risk. Look, when we started this, risk, for sure. I opened my first pot shop, risk. Mm -hmm. Risk like I'm an insane person. Today, we have Rohrbach or Farr. Today, we have 29 states. Today, we have Congress that is in favor of this. Today, we have our neighbors to the north. For those that don't know, Canada is legalizing marijuana in June, recreationally. Everybody 21 and over, federally. So it's the perception of risk, Absolutely. right? But yep. the risk that we're taking now as investors, like if you had taken that risk five years ago, real risk. Today it's reputational risk, perception of all the other things. But I just want to go ahead and box the comment of yeah. risk. Um, it's not like going to jail or having your money taken risk. Yep. Yeah. Let's talk about the money, because that song I sang, um, it ends you with did a, very well, it, it ends with a thank you. It ends with a stick up. Um, uh, of a grower um, who's got a lot of cash, carrying a lot of cash somewhere on the red, on 299, one imagines. Um, Matt, l th this bank question. Um, what, what is the case for State Bank? And you, you sounded some skeptical notes about it because it couldn't connect to other banks. I mean, I, we've heard the idea of a state bank in other contexts, right? Not just I, I am not opposed to a state bank in the bigger sense of having the state take uh, some responsibility for the short Comings of our financial institutions on a number of issues. In terms of having a state bank, as we've seen with Colorado and their attempt, I think more of a credit union, um, there are a number of issues it would not resolve for the marijuana industry. And the not having connectivity between that bank and other financial institutions, I think, is paramount. 
it also becomes a sitting duck in some ways for this current administration and the current <coughs> attorney general. If we have, let's say, the State Bank of California and there's four locations and these become depositories for all this cash, unless we hide them underground or they're secret locations, what's to stop our attorney general from raiding those and seizing all that cash based on mm -hmm. federal law? Also, not having the ability to uh, be part of the bigger federal financial system. We saw when Colorado tried to start their financial institution, state run, to address these concerns, uh, they were denied a license from uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Now, our Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco is slightly different makeup, slightly different philosophy. They might go rogue and issue the license. I would be surprised, but I mean, we're still dealing with bankers, even though they're in San Francisco. <laughs> the idea, though, that you're having this independent state-run bank is almost like fool's gold. Now, and I want to be very clear because I have a lot of constituents, a lot of people who come to me in our committee with the idea of a state bank. And I, I like state banks, especially what they're doing in North Dakota and providing infrastructure. What do they do? Just a brief well, there's a, the, the only state bank really is the one in North Dakota, and it provides infrastructure loans, it provides uh, student loans, it provides small business loans. I think it's uh, entered into the foray of... Um, small dollar or payday lending type loans. You know, basically any bank is responsible to its shareholders. Well, in the case of a state bank, its shareholders are the people of that state. Uh, they assume some of the risk and they also get more of the public benefit of it. That doesn't really address some of the concerns of marijuana uh, industry developing into a now a legal legitimate industry and the financial network of services they need. And connectivity is, to me, key, because if you want to have a state bank that doesn't take Visa, MasterCard, or checks, and it's still just a cash business, and you have armored cars picking up this cash and taking it to this state bank, that doesn't seem to solve the real problem here. The real problem is legitimacy. It's making sure someone can use their Apple Pay or Google Wallet or their Visa at a marijuana dispensary. It's making sure that they can pay their payroll in a legitimate way and not try to have to pay people out in cash. It's making sure they can pay their taxes and their vendors and, and maybe just their, when you talk about vendors, I'm not just talking about the people that grow the marijuana or people that are in the marijuana industry. I'm talking about the cleaning company or the company that does their payroll or the company that you know, services uh, you know, their machines. You know? So if we're gonna make a legitimate business in California, we really need to work to put pressure on our federal representatives to take this class one status away to allow us to have a real robust discussion with our financial institutions about let's take this out of the gray area and make it a legitimate business. But, it's but, but, so, but short of that, what do we do in 2018? I mean, in 2019 and maybe 2020? Yeah. I mean, is it, do you go offshore? I mean, I read in the yeah. papers, there's some law firms that can structure some really interesting things in the yeah. Caymans, well, right? Well, Hezekiah could probably, <laughs> and Kat could answer that better, but I'll say this. Well, <laughs> what I would not, what I don't want to see is legislation before we see the, well, look, we have this pass, it's, it's gonna be going into effect with the regulations coming out soon. We're gonna have a myriad of different levels of government coming up with regulations. I don't think we have an opportunity in California to pass more legislation right now on the banking side until we see it develop and we see some of the new challenges. Uh, you know, really what we're looking at right now though is will we use the technology we have presently probably doesn't address all the concerns of the financial institutions or the marijuana businesses to find that solution. The Obama administration was trying to thread a needle and unfortunately it didn't work and this administration wants to shut down shop. So what we're trying to look at is, is there gonna be new technology coming out through virtual currency that can somehow replace traditional financial institutions and make this a non-factor? Are we gonna be able to see financial institutions take risks that they otherwise aren't taking right now because they see the amount of profit available? You know, could we see some type of state bank develop in Colorado or California or Washington and create their own network between themselves. You know, there's a lot of possibilities. Right now, though, I think we have to kind of let these regulations play out. And unfortunately, there'll be some growing pains. And then we'll kind of see what the right on the wall is in a, and go from there. Hezekiah, what do the growers need in sure. terms of banking? Um, you know, and I do want to mention that I, I did serve on State Treasurer John Chung's Cannabis Banking Working Group. We did just conclude about a year's worth of work uh, yesterday with the release of the report that the Assembly member referenced early on. And so if I could just take a moment to lay yeah, out sort of, sure. there were four recommendations technically, but I, I, I boil them down to sort of three principles. First, there's the Band-Aid, you know, and I, <clears throat> 
I like the analogy of a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. I mean, it's going to be hard to stop this bleeding. Um, nonetheless, we do need to get cash out of, you know, out of our mattresses, frankly. Yeah. Um, and, and any way that the state can partner, public-private partnerships to facilitate that immediate goal, I look forward to working with the folks here to figure out how to do that. Secondly, it's not actually illegal to bank our businesses. It's just really, really hard and really, really expensive. And so there may be ways that the state can help streamline that compliance process. And, and there may be room for a public institution that falls short of what we would traditionally think of as a bank, but actually does help with some of the compliance, serves private sector banks in a cooperative sense, you know, form an entity, a consortium of banks and serve them. So the second point there is what can the state do to help the banks? And then, you know, the third step really does come back to the key question here, which is federal policy reform. Unless and until we see an act of Congress, it is hard to imagine full normalized banking financial relations for our industry. And so that does need to be the end goal. Um, what do we need most? Uh, frankly, we need like bridge loans, $75,000 in working capital to meet one-time regulatory hurdles that as hardworking small business owners, we're having a hard time meeting. Unfortunately, the, the um, financial markets currently aren't quite interested, not big enough, not enough returns. Small businesses with modest returns, critically important to our rural communities. We're creating 350,000 good jobs in parts of California that can't afford job loss. But we can't find those simple tools. If we could go to any bank and get a typical small business cash flow loan, we'd be in great shape over the next three yeah. years. Unfortunately, there are significant barriers. We talked at the beginning about what does it mean to be successful. I said as many businesses as possible. That's not to say they're all gonna succeed. That means the market decides which one succeeds, and that means they all get a chance to get in. And in order to achieve that, we need to reduce the barriers, significant policy barriers. You know, there are 70% of the counties of the land mass in the state of California that are still not issuing permits. Without a permit, it doesn't matter how hyper-regulated you wanna be, you're a criminal. No matter what, just point blank. Yeah. We've got some significant policy work to do. We have significant financial barriers. Inefficiencies may not be the worst thing if it means better jobs, better products produced more in balance with natural resources. Let's be fair, this doesn't need to be the failed single bottom line paradigm of the past. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do, but I think what we need most right now is fifty to $150,000 to meet one-time regulatory hurdles. Kat, Curran, Adam, is there anything you would add on banking to what you just heard? You know, I would just say that, you know, um, similar to what the assemblyman was, was talking about, um, there are solutions that people are trying to create and innovate with technology, um, and we've been assessing a lot of those. And, it, you know, what the, the question we struggle with is, are you creating an interim solution, or are you creating something that can be structural for the industry long term? And we always almost you know, get stuck on the interim part. And obviously as investors, you know, we want to be involved in businesses that have uh, the ability to, 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 to be there for the long term and become a structural component of the cannabis industry. I think that's what's so exciting about this opportunity, unlike others, is that you know, we're building a lot of these um, technologies from the ground up to service this industry, and we have an opportunity to you know, really dictate the way this business operates. Um, and, and obviously, it's, it's existed in, in, in different fashions for, for many years, but now with, with uh, regulations and legalization, it's a, it's a pretty exciting opportunity. So if we can get excited about um, something that can actually have long-term uh, you know, use in the industry overall, even post-federal legalization, I think that's where, where we get stuck as investors of sort of you know, backing anything in, in that regards. Um, Kat, a question you hear a lot about the need for this to be done and, and you talk with, with, with social equity um, and having an industry that is, that, that is promoting that. What does that mean specifically? Um, what does that look like? If you, if you have an industry in five and 10 years that's built that is social equity, what, what, would, what, would be, what would be the characteristics of it? So we've been using the word criminal uh, a lot lately during this panel. And uh, if you look at police statistics, uh, it would become very clear and apparent that uh, although lots of people were engaged in criminal activity, only certain groups of people were actually arrested uh, or convicted for, for this activity. Uh, and this is not just the case here in California, this is across the United States. 
uh, across the United States, African Americans and Latinos are four times more likely to be arrested uh, for marijuana. Uh, even here in the state of California, uh, in 2015, African Americans were two times more likely to be arrested for a marijuana misdemeanor and five times more likely to be arrested for a marijuana felony. Uh, and this is just two years ago. So when we're talking about how we move forward, uh, and not to mention that those cannabis arrests, uh, a lot of people feel as though those were just slap on, slaps on the wrist. Uh, but a cannabis arrest could mean that you were denied uh, housing, education, employment opportunities uh, for decades. And if, we're, if, if we imagine, uh, for instance, in the city of Los Angeles, although African Americans are only 10% of the population, those folks were seven times more likely to be arrested. So that means that you were seven times uh, less likely to have an opportunity for housing, education, and employment. And let me back up one more time. Uh, it was interesting, when I, when I was doing research and I first began to become interested in, in what cannabis policy would mean, uh, not only for uh, California, but, but across the United States, I, I found out that almost half of all drug arrests have been for marijuana. And 88% of those marijuana arrests had been for possession alone. So that's the type of criminal activity that we have been arresting and denying people housing, education, and employment opportunities for possession. So now that we're building this industry from scratch, I, I feel as though we, we will have absolutely failed if we do not take a moment to acknowledge the harms that these community members have experienced. I think that if we you know, flip a switch and we move forward and we act as though those things didn't happen, we would have done it all wrong. Uh, so social equity for me means moving forward with that acknowledgement and trying to figure out ways that new cannabis policies don't uh, exacerbate past harms of past cannabis policies. And there are a number of ways that we can do that. Uh, in the state of California, we're talking about this word criminal. The only difference between uh, doing criminal activity in the city of Los Angeles as it relates to cannabis and not doing criminal activity in the city of Los Angeles is whether or not you'll have a license from my department. So it is critically important that we license community members who are thought to have been uh, criminal because 10 years from now, although we are in this period of time where we are decriminaliz decriminalizing, uh, I, I, I assure you that we will quickly move into a moment where we want to criminalize this activity. We want more penalties. Uh, the people who are investing are gonna say, those folks, they're not paying taxes. They didn't have to pay the $150,000 in startup costs. They didn't have to pay for the build out. Uh, that's cutting into their profit. We are going to recriminalize this activity and it's going to be based on whether or not you have a license or not. So social equity is making sure that uh, those community members and all community members, uh, but especially those who have been disproportionately harmed by enforcement, have access to this economic opportunity so that they don't get left behind uh, in the green rush. And a quick question for you, Hezekiah. And the part of the state, the North State, uh, poor part of the state struggling after, from you know, being a resources economy. You know, what, what can equity look like in that context? I mean, what could change there if this Simple goes well? Simple metric, more small businesses. The, the more opportunity there are for businesses to succeed, the more folks can get involved, the more likely we are to create the opportunities for the folks that, that Kat just spoke about. And you know, my community and the rural communities, Mendocino County had the highest arrest rate for cannabis uh, per capita. Go figure, that's not a surprise. Mendocino County is a hot spot for cannabis activity, but you know we're, we're no stranger to arrests and five-year federal mandatory minimums. Did you know that any cultivation is a five-year manda mandatory minimum sentence? No, no judge's discretion, that's just what it is. 10 years if you have more than 100 plants, which from a commercial grower's perspective is kind of uh, likely. So um, slow it down, <coughs> take more time, this doesn't have to happen overnight. The market will crash and consolidate if we do this too fast. This is decades of cultural barriers that we need to overcome. Our communities need time to transition from where we are to where we're going. And it is in the interest of the state of California to provide the maximum amount of opportunity possible. And 
you know, to that note, Kat, I do want to respectfully say that our organization did not support Prop 64, but only because of the timelines and because we thought a few more years wouldn't have hurt. So rather than going to 2022 rather than just, before let's dive into it and go, um, you know, uh, this is going to be a very challenging transition. And so, you know, what it looks like in rural communities is more smaller businesses, more smaller farms. Adam, let me ask you to address that. How do you see the industry working? Can we have that kind of equity that, that many small businesses? What is this going to look like in, in 10 years if, if things go well? Is it going to be heavily consolidated? Is it going to look like it's going to look like wine? Going to look like beer with the big distributor in the middle? You just asked me two questions, though. Yeah, I know, like three. I do that. <laughs> Which one do I start Well, with? no, the answer is Which what do you think do this looks like answer? in 10 years? What does this industry look like in 10 years? Well, you asked me the equity thing first. Yeah. Um, so I think on the equity side, right, like as, as I was mentioning earlier, yeah. great intentions, piss poor execution, right? And you know, Illinois was actually the first state to come out and say, hey, we're going to add social equity to our metric as we judge these applicants for licensure, right? And that gets back to my whole thing about California having the benefit of these other states that have made great efforts, right, and with, with the right, with righteous um, intentions, but have failed. Maryland tried to do it. They failed. They're now in court cases and all this other stuff. So I think small businesses, um, you know, uh, people that have been disproportionately affected by this failed, horrific war on drugs, I think there is a way in which we, we can include them in the future of this industry. I think what's important to recognize, right, which is why these others have failed, is that you're not going to include them, and I agree with Hezekiah on this, right? You're not going to include them by saying, hey, you're a disproportionate, dis disproportionately impacted minority from a neighborhood somewhere here, so now you're going to go get a license to grow pot next to MedMen's license to grow pot in Desert Hot Springs. All you need is $15 million, right? That's a failure. So to Hezekiah's point about small businesses, right, I think it's about, okay, how do you go ahead and craft a thoughtful, a thoughtful way in which to license and license uh, or create an opportunity to license the small business guys or, and women, and also create an opportunity to license and welcome big business. I think that so much in this industry, we have these fights about big business versus mom and pop. Like in California, this is not working unless you have both. You will not be able to service the state of California if you don't have big business. As much as some of the people that Hezekiah represents hate big business, right, Hezekiah? I mean. They're, they're, the smile's enough, right? Like, they, we they don't disdain hate big, business. big business. We hate big business that put their profit ahead of the well-being of our community and the sustainable use of our natural resources, just to clarify. There you go. <laughs> Boom! So, so right, but, but you're never going to win. We're never going to have a real program if you don't have big business, but you're also never going to have a real program if all you have is med men and you don't have small businesses in rural communities and you don't have you know, minority participation in communities that are disproportionately impacted by the failed war on drugs. So you gotta do it all, and I think that we can do it all in California. So how does it look in five, 10 years? Mm, yeah. I mean, is that where we're getting? Yeah. Crystal ball? I mean, I think the way it looks in five, 10 years is I think that you will have m and I mean, this, look, money talks at the end of the day. Like, you can go have the best intentions in the world, but this is a, people say five, six, seven, eight billion dollar legal industry in the state of California. You think that that's gonna just be left to mom and pop? Like, it will happen. Money, money will chase money, and things will consolidate. And that is just our, that's our world that we live in. So I think what it looks like in five, 10 years, I think you have tremendous roll up. I think that you will have a few big players that have a disproportionate percentage of the total market. But you will have a lot of other players, if done correctly, the mom and pop you know, <laughs> operators that are also feeding that same system. I want to get to Matt and Curran before we run out of time. Matt. Um, again, w in terms of what things look like, you know, the, the, when, when uh, prohibition ended in California, it produced the most powerful lobby and lobbyist and political boss in the history of the state, Ari Samish, who yeah. ruled the legislature because he had the liquor uh, as his clients. Um, you know, anytime you get a, a, a new business comes on, you, you folks in Sacramento, nothing personal, but you yeah. react. You, yeah. you know, there are issues around environment, water use, treatment of workers in this. Um, do you expect this to be a big activity in Sacramento in the years to come? Is this is there a big lobby? Is there a you know? I mean, any casinos were the same. They became a huge force once they became legal. Uh, I will I will say that this will be one of the top four issues we work on for the next six to eight years and maybe longer. And then 
and 10 years from now, they'll probably be selling marijuana at Target. I don't know what else to say, but in terms of... <laughs> In, in which section? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and they might have a target select like they do with their wine now. Uh, but in, in reality, uh, there, this involves so many committees, health, natural resources, banking, privacy and technology, uh, public safety. So I, people often come to me and say, why doesn't the state of California have one specific standing committee that does just technology? You have a privacy committee, you have this committee. I said, well, here's the reason. Everything we do now involves technology, whether it's insurance, banking, healthcare, law enforcement. Every one of our standing committees, for the most part, has some type of involvement with technology. And to a lesser degree, marijuana, and now with legalization as a recreational drug for adults, is going to be in a very much similar vein. It's going to be involved with legislation in the banking committee. There could be some insurance stuff. There's definitely going to be some privacy and consumer protection issues, health public safety. I could go down the list of all the other committees. So this is going to be much more invasive into our daily <laughs> lives as legislators. You're going to see already there's a big lobbying presence. There's going to be much more of a lobbying and advocacy presence. And at the end of the day, you know, we've seen some examples. Gaming, alcohol, how this takes shape will be a little different and obviously very specific to this industry. Um, but it will be heavily regulated and there's going to be a lot of uh, legislators both at the state level and the city level who will be very much involved. Hopefully Congress and the next administration will remove this as a Schedule One drug and make all our lives easier and add the financial institution's ability to involve themselves on that side of it for, for this. Can, last, last question occurring, because I think we're, 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 we're short on time um, and a little over. Um, <laughs> you have a history, uh, a, a record of, of building brands in uh, digital media and entertainment. So this state is uh, about digital, it's about entertainment, it's about culture. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you think about, and you're also investing in all these ancillary um, products, what, what, how does the state look different to its people as they go about their lives, as they go to restaurants and bars, or you know, turn on the internet and the television and they're like, yeah. what, 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 how is this likely to, to, to sort of get into all of our lives? Yeah, I think the big shift is gonna be uh, over the course of 10 years is that the stigma that has slowly been, you know, dissipating over time will hopefully be, you know, removed completely or, or, or as, you know, as close to that as possible. And I think that is the, the biggest issue. When you look at alcohol, it's so pervasive in our lives, right? There's not a, a moment, uh, you know, an activity that we couldn't be having a, a beverage and it's hundreds of years of branding to make it socially acceptable in so many different situations. And that's just alcohol. Cannabis has the opportunity to go, you know, well beyond where alcohol ever was, right? Um, all you have to look to is, you know, last week, um, you know, there was a, a huge investment from Constellation Brands, $40 billion public company, into, you know, one of the largest cultivators uh, in, in Canada. And, you know, the, the reason the CEO gave um, was much more around the creation of non-alcoholic cannabis beverages than it was around, you know, just some diversity in, in a hedge. And I think that's what's really compelling here. When we come to, you know, a point from 10 years from now, I think, you know, we'll, we'll reach a space where everyone in this audience has, you know, a potential use uh, for cannabis in their daily lives. And whether that's, you know, for beauty products, whether that's for beverages or medicinal, et cetera, I think that is gonna be the pervasive nature that I don't think any of us are, are prepared for. And I do think we'll see it in Target, and I don't think you'll see it in many aisles, sort of, you know, just beyond, you know, one for, you know, smoking products. Beauty product, what could cannabis do for me? It's, it's already in lot. Walmart and granola. <laughs> <laughs> got it, got it. Very we, good. Can, we can talk after. Uh, I think, <laughs> um, I think we're, we're, we're it, right? Um, uh, thank you very, very much. And please join me in thanking thank this. You. Thank you.